Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to uh, invite you to turn to the book of John, chapter 10. John chapter 10. As you're turning there, I just wanted to uh, publicly say thank you to Carlone for filling the pulpit last week as he preached on how Jesus is the light of the world. And, you know, I got to, I got to worship with you all as I sat on the beach, and I was really suffering as I did that. But I will say, it's great to be able to watch online, but nothing is better than being back with your church family. But I'm so thankful um, for Carlone filling the pulpit and really sharing about how Jesus is the light of the world. And really what he looked at is just a part of it just, man, really it's this whole section that all takes place together. We're going to look at this week and next week as well. You see the, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles had just happened and right after how Jesus declares that he is the light of the world, what you'll see is just, man, the next chapter, he sees a man who's been blind. And what Jesus does is he sends that man to the pool of Siloam to wash his eyes after Jesus puts muds on it, and then he is miraculously given sight. And what we see is, right before we get into this passage in John 10, the reaction of the religious leaders was not joy in seeing this man who was blind but could now see. It should have been overwhelming joy. I hope as we saw these three students, Alicia and Grace and Lincoln, as we see, man, just the picture of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and the decision that they've made, man, it, I hope it brought tears to your eyes and just brought joy to your hearts. Because when we were blind, but now we see how it should be overwhelming joy, but what we see is the religious leaders in John chapter 9, their reaction to Jesus healing this blind man is not joy and not amazement, but it's, oh, we've caught him because he did this on the Sabbath, and he shouldn't have been doing it on the Sabbath. They are looking for ways to discredit Jesus because they want to remain in their positions of power and prominence. And so what we're going to see is after this has happened, Jesus is going to have this dialogue, really a monologue towards the religious leaders. And it's really good to know that context of what has just happened as we dive in here to John chapter 10. So if you would please stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning, we're going to look at the first 10 verses of John chapter 10. And this is what Jesus says, truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, I am am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so they may have life and have it in abundance. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We are so thankful for your word. God, we're so thankful this morning that your son, Jesus, is our gate. Or that there is eternal life, that there is abundant life through him. So I pray, God, that we all would recognize that this morning. 
We would all submit to you that we'd follow you, that we'd pursue after you and you alone. Lord, I just pray for the next few moments, Lord. I pray you'd remove distractions from this place. Bind the enemy from here. God, I pray your spirit would move and it would work. God, I pray you turn our mind's attention and our heart's affection to you and to your word. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. So in honor of Disciple Now, I wanted to use an illustration of one of my favorite TV shows back when I was a student, okay? Before there was ever Wipeout on American television, all right, there's something called Total Extreme Elimination. And I think as you see this clip, you'll see why it's appropriate for our message today. Been caught in the net, and now the boxing monster is going to box him. Round the ears. Well, ow, you can feel that. Oh, dear. Ow. Save him right for wearing his pajamas. Good lad. Oh, lost his footing, but he's still going through the mire. Oh, but no, netted and now boxed. Through. Man, what a masterpiece of cinema, right? I love it. All right, and you know, you can see like slapstick comedy, I'm a sucker for it, but anybody will do anything to get on TV, right? But you get that whole thing, that, that whole premise of that little game was there were four doors, uh, different sections, and three of them were like wood or had nets or whatever, but only one door was paper that you could get through. And the idea was you had to go through the right door in order to win that particular game. And so what, right here in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. Other, what, other translations you'll see, he says, I am the door. What he's telling us is he is the only way. And that's the first thing that we see as we read John 10, what we have to be very clear on is there's only one way. There's only one way. You see, these religious leaders have been confronting Jesus and they're challenging him because they're saying, how could you heal this blind man on the Sabbath? How are you not, how are you doing all these other things? How are you trying to upend our whole religious system? And they're missing out on the fact that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, who has the ability to give sight to the blind. He is, as Carlone preached on last week, the light of the world. But the religious le- leaders, they confront Jesus, and so we see he kind of turns the tables on them. And this is what he tells them. Look at verse one again. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it up for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now understand this is the context of what would happen. All right, You'd have these these towns, these villages in the ancient Near East and Israel, and what they would do is, off of a house usually, they'd build this large enclosure. Really, it was more of a fence, all right? Sometimes there'd be stone, sometimes there'd be brush, briars, other things like that, but it really would be like a, a tall fence that would go and it'd wrap around off the side of somebody's house. And as we all know, if you, have a, if you have a fence in your yard, you need a gate to get into it, right? You need a door to get in, and so what would happen is you'd either have this kind of rudimentary gate, or really what would often happen is you have these townspeople, they'd, they'd pool together their resources, they'd have this large sheep pen, the shepherds were watching the sheep all day, they'd lead them into this pen, and then what they'd do, they'd hire a gatekeeper, and that gatekeeper would be the person who would lay across the threshold of this gate, so that no sheep could get in, and then no 
pre- or no sheep could get out and no predators could get in. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying that and there's, there's only one proper way to get into the sheep pen and it's through the gate. He says if you try to go other ways, if you're climbing over the wall, you're climbing over the fence, then you're a thief or you're a robber. And really what he's telling these religious leaders is that is what they have been. Because instead of leading the people of God to an understanding of who God is and what he's done, instead of celebrating the fact that Jesus came, left heaven, came to earth to come and be their savior, he's just given sight to the blind and their response is not joy or exultation, their response is how can we discredit him so we can maintain our power and maintain our control? So Jesus looks at them and he lets them know and there's only one way into the sheep pen. And the way that you guys have been leading, you are demonstrating that you are thieves, that you are robbers, that you are false teachers, that you are false leaders. And really, it, it kind of helps us. We can look back to Ezekiel chapter 34. And you don't need to turn there, but I just want to read a little bit as, as we see in Ezekiel to talk about, man, the false shepherds and the true shepherd that will come. And we know that Jesus, right after he says, I'm the gate, next week we'll look about how he says, I'm also the good shepherd. I'm the one who will lead us. But this is what it says, Ezekiel 34. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who've been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? You eat the fat, wear the wool, and butcher the fat and animal, but you do not tend the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays or sought the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. He's calling out these religious leaders. He says, you're not caring for your people. You're worried about just enriching yourselves. You want power, you want control. Man, you've just come to this alliance with the Roman government so that you can have your temple and run things your way and you can make money and have power and prestige and that's what you're focused on. And look, you have the blind man, right? Now what's so, what's so interesting is during the Feast of Tabernacles, one thing that they would do is they would go to the Pool of Siloam every day and they'd take water from the Pool of Siloam and they'd come and they'd put it on the bronze altar there in the temple and it's a reminder of how when the Israelites were in the desert, that God miraculously provided water for them. It was no mistake that right as the, this feast is ending, this feast of booths, that Jesus sends this blind man to that pool where he washes his eyes and all of a sudden he can see. Jesus was saying, I am the living water. I am the one who provides. I am the one you turn to. And the religious leader's response is to attempt to discredit him. And Ezekiel 34 sure sounds a lot. The shepherds that he's describing sure sounds a lot like the religious leaders that we see in Jesus' day. They're not caring about strengthening the weak, healing the sick, bandaging the injured, bringing back the strays, seeking the lost. They just want to take care of themselves. And look what he says, verse 10 and following. This is what the Lord God says, look, I am against those shepherds. I will demand my flock from them and prevent them from shepherding the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves, so I'll rescue my flock from their mouths, so they will not be food for them. For this is what the Lord God says, see, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he's among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and total darkness. I'll bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in the inhabited places of the land. I will tend them in good pasture. 
and their grazing place will be on Israel's lofty mountains. There they will lie down in a good grazing place. They will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. And I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. And you can see how a lot of the the terminology from Ezekiel 34 is evident in John chapter 10 when Jesus says that if anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and he'll go in and go out and he will find pasture. He's saying he is the true shepherd and he is the gate. He says the only true shepherd, you notice what he says about, man, you'd have all these different people bring all their sheep, the shepherds would drop off their sheep, and how do those sheep from different families have different shepherds as they're put in a pen at night, how would they know who to follow? They would all recognize the shepherd's voice. All right, Friday, we're preparing our house for Disciple Now, and we're getting ready, and then the, the doorbell rings, and I just assumed it was another Amazon order, right? <laughs> and I, I was sitting back in my room. I wasn't paying that much attention, but then I, I heard something. I heard a distinct voice, and I said, I recognize that voice, and it was Dr. Lee, and Dr. Lee had stopped by and dropped off some cookies that I hope Janice made. <laughs> But I recognized his voice, and I went out there, and I went in, and I had a conversation with him, and he said, yeah, he said, that's my thing. I said, I heard your voice, and I recognized He said, yeah, that's always been my thing. He said, I have a very distinct voice. He said, all my patients, they knew right away. And Jesus is saying, sheep recognize their shepherd's voice. That's how they know who to follow. They're all put in that same pen. Then the shepherd comes, he calls out to them, they recognize his voice, and they follow after him. There's only one way that those sheep will follow after the shepherd, and it's through the correct gate. And then he tells these religious leaders the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, verse 5. Instead, they'll run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. And I love, Jesus is giving this monologue, and then we see John gives us a little bit of his, man, he's narrating. He tells us, look at verse 6. I think this is so funny. He says, Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they didn't understand what he was telling them. The religious leaders are so dense, they don't really get that he's subtly telling them, you guys are false teachers. And so he very bluntly says this, verse seven, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Saying don't worry about being subtle, here's the truth, I am the gates. That's how you get to the pasture. That's how you get abundant life. It's through me. He says, I am the gates. Loses any hint of subtlety. I have a five-year-old daughter, and she doesn't do subtle either, all right? So a few months ago, Avi came to me, and she wanted a Ken doll. She's got a lot of Barbies, but all of a sudden she wanted Ken. She's never been interested in Ken. And of course she came to me, not mom, because she knew that she'd get what she wants when she came to me, right? So sure enough, she asks for Ken, and Dad goes, and he gets her Ken. I was like, that's kind of interesting. She goes, no, Daddy, you're a boy, so you get to be Ken. I was like, oh, I didn't know this means I'm playing Barbie Dreamhouse, right? (laughs) So it's bad enough that I'm up in a room playing Barbie Dreamhouse, but this is what she does. My daughter, man, pray for her future husband, right? Because she's like, Daddy, Ken says this. I'm like, well, what if Ken wants to? She's like, no. (laughs) I'll tell you what Ken says, and then you say it. All right, all right, awesome, all right. Maybe, I'm like, maybe Ken wants to swim in the pool. No, he doesn't, right? I'll tell you what Ken does. So I guess it's good I never have to worry about what my daughter is thinking because she'll tell me. Not very subtle. And what we see here is Jesus drops any semblance of subtlety in this discussion with the religious leaders. 
says, look at me. He says, I am the gates. This is how you get eternal life. This is how you go through the pasture. This is the way it's through me. I mean, think about it. If you own a home, how do you get into the home? Through the door, right? How many of you say, you know what? I'm going to climb through my window today. Maybe you lost your keys, right? So true story, in college, all right, my, my little college apart, dorm apartment thing, first floor, we had the, man, the sand volleyball court right outside of our window, so my roommate and I were like, why would we go through the trouble of going in through the lobby and then going to our door? So we just started going in and out of our window. And so we got called to the dean's office because he thought we'd like lost our keys to the apartment, right? It's like, I know that's your, I know that's your dorm room, but why are you climbing through the window? That is not appropriate. And we're like, well, we think it's kind of fun, and it cuts out the middle. So we had to stop doing that. He's like, no, you go through the door. You don't just go through the window. When you go to your house today, unless you want to pretend to be Santa, you're not going through the chimney to get in, right? We go through the door. And what Jesus is letting us know is he's saying, look, there's only one gate. There's only one way in. There's only one door. If you're trying to get to the sheep by climbing over the wall, you are a wolf. You are a thief. You are a robber. He says, if you're not looking out for the good of our people, he's saying, religious leaders, you're just looking out for yourselves and you're missing the point. You have to go through me. If the building belongs to you, you go through the door. And Jesus is saying, these are my sheep. And this is the way to abundant life. Look at verse nine. I am the gate. He says it again. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. What incredible news. And he will come in and go out and he will find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come so they may have life and have it in abundance. So if we want abundant life, if we want eternal life, if we want to spend forever in heaven with Jesus, we have to go through him. And you remember that video we watched? It's, a, it's just a really silly video. But the concept was interesting. They had four doors set up. Three of them were false doors. Couldn't go through. There was only one door that you could go through to get through the next round. In the same way, what we have to be aware of If Jesus is our gate, then we have to beware of false gates. We have to beware of false gates. So let's just talk about that for a minute, because he talks about this, right? He says, hey, man, you go through me, you get eternal life, but a thief will come and will try to steal and kill and destroy. He says, there's only one way, there's only one gate. Only one way to eternal life. What are those other false gates that won't lead? Well, you think there are other false religions all over the world, right? From Buddhism to Hinduism to Islam to Mormonism, etc. All of those are false gates. None of those religions can lead to eternal life. It's only through Christ. And I want to make that very clear. Because sadly, shockingly, there's this Recent survey by the Pew Research Center. And on this survey, 52% of the respondents said they were Christian. 52% of professing Christians, excuse me, in the United States, they answered that they believe there are some non-Christian religions that lead to heaven. Now look, just because you claim on a survey you are a Christian doesn't mean that you are, but it's pretty alarming that 52%, over half, said 
Yeah, there's other religions. It's the whole idea of religious pluralism. Hey, kind of believe whatever you want to believe. Be a good person. Try those different things. And man, man, we'll get up to heaven in the end because God will understand. But here, Jesus tells us very clearly, I am the gate. If you enter by me, you'll be saved. It's only through him. He is the only way. Jesus claims exclusivity. That's why he had to die. He had to die to pay for our sins on the cross. There's only one gate. And so he said, we have to be aware because he says a thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. And so if you think about this, we have to understand Jesus is the only gate, but there's so many other things that are gonna try to rob us and, and try to steal this idea of abundant life from us. What are other doors or gates that we try to go through to find abundant life, to find these other things? So of course there's the idea of, man, legalism and it's doing good works and good deeds and this is what the religious leaders had fallen into. Instead of understanding that all of the Old Testament, all of the law, all the prophets, they all point to Jesus. They said if we just follow these rules and make enough rules and be good enough People, that's how we are going to earn God's favor. But legalism is a false door. It's a false gate. It will rob us of abundant life. But think even in, in America today. Think about all the different things we go, we try to pursue for abundant life. Man, in America, so often it's money. If I just made a little more, I would have abundant life. In my job, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just advance far enough in the company, then I'll have abundant life. That's what it's about, man. That abundant life, that prosperity will come if just a bigger paycheck, a better job, something like that. Or we look at relationships. If I could just find the right guy or the right girl, man, then I'll have abundant life. Or maybe some of us who are married here, we say, man, if my spouse would just, be, would just fix themselves, then I'll have abundant life, right? Or we look at our kids. It's incredible gifts from God. And we say, man, I'm going to build them up, and they're going to be on all the best teams, and they're going to get good grades. And if they could just get that scholarship, they could just go get that one good job. They could just do this. Man, that's how I'm going to find abundant life. See, my kids being incredibly successful. It's all about these achievements. And look, a lot of those things in and of themselves, man, God gives us a lot of grace and a lot of incredible gifts. But none of those things will lead to abundant life. None of those things lead to eternal life. Jesus makes it very clear in this passage. He is the only way. And notice, when he talks about this idea of abundant life, I love the picture. I love John 10, 10. That Greek word, periso, when it says, when it's talking about abundant, it means literally, if you can translate it, it means life beyond your wildest dreams. Man, a life better than you could ever have imagined. And because we're sinners, then we go straight to prosperity, and we think that means easy, comfortable life right now, in the here and now. They go, oh, just following Jesus, I'll have health, wealth, prosperity, it's all going to be great. But that's another false door, is the prosperity gospel. If you follow Jesus, it's going to be easy. Jesus never says it's going to be easy. In fact, he says that if you want to follow him, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow him. The abundant life that he's promising isn't necessarily prosperity in this life. What he's saying is, as you walk with him, the life you have walking in with him is going to be super abundant beyond anything you could imagine living your life without him. That Jesus makes sense of everything. And so this morning, and students, as you just had disciple now, Know that the world is going to tell you all of these different things, all these false gates that will lead to abundant life, to prosperity. But Jesus claims exclusivity. 
that he is the only gate. And so he is radically exclusive. It's only through him. But he's also radically inclusive because anyone who chooses to follow his voice, follow after him, it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done, the Bible says that you will be saved. So beware of false gates. Know that Jesus is our only source of salvation. Sometimes that can sound a little bit harsh because we say, oh, that's, man, that, that's, that's so wrong and mean to all these other people. They're trying their best and doing the best that they can. And doesn't God understand all of those other things? But here's the thing. Man, we want to be tolerant of other people's opinions, but not when they deny absolute truths. If I owed you $10 and I came and I brought you a dime, if I brought you 10 cents, say, hey, it's basically the same thing. I mean, it's 10, right? I don't think you'd be happy about that, would you? Because $10 is not the same as 10 cents. Or if I told you, hey, I need 10 feet of this material and you brought me 10 inches, there'd be a problem because feet aren't the same as inches, right? If I came to you, I said, man, I've got a massive headache. Massive headache. Man, I, I really need some Advil. You say, okay, here's some arsenic. We'd have a problem, right? They're not the same things. And so when Jesus here is saying, I am the gate, it's actually a kindness to us that he is so clear. Because we know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. So we want to be tolerant of other people's opinions. We're never going to budge on absolutes. We don't do it in matters of money or medicine. Why would we do it in matters of faith? So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're sitting out here, if you're joining us online and you've never made that decision to walk through the gate that is Jesus, to trust in his finished work on the cross, The Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. And I was so encouraged by these three students, their bold testimony this morning. And maybe that's you, maybe you said, you know what, I know who Jesus is, I believe in all that, but I haven't followed through in believer's baptism. But I want to encourage you to take that step of faith to publicly proclaim that you are his Follow their example and follow after Jesus. It's time for us to leave it all behind to go through the one true gate. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. And God, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that your son Jesus is our true gate. And I pray right now, Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room or that hasn't yet made that decision to repent of their sins, to trust in you, to follow you, to walk through that gate, God, I pray that you would just soften their heart right now, Lord, that your spirit would draw them to yourself, even as we're praying. God, I'm so thankful for the powerful testimony of Alicia and Grace and Lincoln this morning. So I just pray, God, you'd stir in people's hearts. If there's anyone sitting out here that hasn't made that decision to follow through in believers' baptism, Lord, I pray the testimony of those three teenagers would stir something in their hearts right now. God, I pray that we'd stop pursuing the things of this world things that will never satisfy. God, we pursue you because you give us abundant life. We love you, Lord. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.